I was thinking about my introduction, and I was going back and forth about changing it, but since John threw a little shade my way, I'm going to throw some back, um, <laughs> because we are continuing a series called The I Am's of Jesus, and if you are listening closely, um, there are no I Am statements in this passage. Um, it's also Palm Sunday, and this is not a Palm Sunday passage, and so when John and I met on Monday, I was like, this is the one you want, right? I didn't misread what you wanted, and he said, yes. He says, but you can change it if you want, and I am not one to back down from a challenge. Um, so challenge accepted, and we're going to go. But I think this is also important to say, this is not us forcing something into the passage and trying to get to the truth or saying this is about truth, but actually we're just taking what's there. And so I think it's important to remember that as our preaching philosophy is, we're going to look at what's here and then apply that to ourselves. And so we're looking at this to learn the truth about Jesus, about who he is, about who he isn't, what that means, and how we should respond. Um, and this is especially important for us in a time in our culture now where it, well, it's, it doesn't feel like. It's basically experience trumps truth is the culture that we're living in right now, right? We have phrases like live your truth. Um, that kind of exemplify that, that tell us you can determine your own truth and what should guide you and what is good for you and not good for others. Actually, you can't do that one. You can only do what's good for you. You can't tell anybody else what to do. Um, but the problem is, how can we know that our understanding of things, that our truth is actually true and that we're not missing something? There's not something that we don't know that actually tells us how we should be living or that there is a bigger truth that applies to everyone and not just to us. Right? This overlaps with what we think or feel about Jesus. Right? Jesus' identity isn't just what we think about him or what we feel about Jesus or who we think Jesus should be, right? but the truth about who Jesus actually is, and we take that from Scripture. And this morning, we're going to take it even further than that of just understanding the truth about who Jesus is, but to how Jesus actually brings truth to all things is what we're going to end up today. So let's pray as we get started this morning. Um, God, we come before you, and we pray that you would just help us to see in this passage, in this back and forth on a trial of Jesus, that you would help us to see what is true. Help us to see what is helpful. Help us to see what is real. Help us to see how that impacts our life and how we can trust in you as our true king. Help my words to be clear. Help you to flow through me for anything that would be wrong or in error to disappear, but that you would help us to stay focused on your truth this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Now, as I said, this isn't a typical Palm Sunday text. We're going to sort of sneak it in there in a minute because it does help us get some context. But we're picking it up with the trial of Pilate. So he's the Roman governor of Palestine, kind of this big area. And he's placed in this position basically to prevent trouble in this area. Um, and so the Jewish leaders at this point couldn't quite get what they wanted with Jesus. They handed Jesus over to Pilate, hoping that he would do what they couldn't do. And this encounter starts with a question in verse 33, where Pilate asks, Are you the king of the Jews? Now, this is a really important question, and we need a little background in case you don't know what's happening here, just to understand this. Um, under Roman rule, there was only one king, and it was Caesar. And anybody else who even hinted that they might want to be the king or might want to be in power was taken care of um, very quickly so that nothing happened against that. So any threat was immediately eliminated. So when Pilate asked this question, are you the king of the Jews? That's what he's asking. Are you a threat? Are you going to cause trouble? Are you going to start an uprising? Because he didn't want to be the guy that let a threat go through or that didn't take care of it, right? He wanted to make sure he knew exactly what was happening. So we paired this with actually what we're remembering this morning on Palm Sunday, where just a few days before this, Jesus rides into town and people praise him and celebrate him and wave palm branches and say, blessed is he who came, comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel, so there's something happening, and Pilate understands this. Um, John, I think you alluded to this earlier, right? Jesus comes in on a donkey, not on a horse, right? If you're a powerful military-ish leader hoping for an uprising, 
you're going to ride in on a big horse, right? You're not going to choose a donkey, and you're going to have a bunch of people following you. That's not what Jesus does, which is the first sign. That's not really what he's here to do. But there's a lot of rumors flying around, so Pilate's just trying to get to the bottom of it. And Jesus has been handed to Pilate by the religious leaders, so he knows there's something going on. Um, And in light of all this, Jesus answers very carefully because he's trying to understand something else. Right? Are you asking, like, are, Pilate, are you asking me if I'm the king of the Jews, or are you only trying to confirm what you've heard other people say? Right? Are you trying to figure out who I am, or are you just trying to see if I'm a threat? Because Jesus knows it goes two ways. If Pilate meant, are you a political king conspiring against Caesar, the answer is no. But if he meant, are you the messianic king of Israel, the answer would be yes. And so Jesus is feeling out Pilate, which I think is a really interesting moment when we think about Jesus and how he tries to respond in this moment, which is an incredible thing to do. Think about where Jesus is. He's been arrested. He's put on trial. He's dragged around town. He knows that he hasn't done anything wrong, and he knows where these trials are going to lead. But in the midst of that, He's engaging with Pilate, giving him a chance to figure out who he really is, right? Can you imagine being arrested falsely, imprisoned, on trial, and then saying, you know, I think I'm going to take a minute and make sure that the guy questioning me is really okay, because he might need to know about who I really am, who Jesus really is, right? That's what Jesus does in this moment. What what an amazing picture of compassion that Jesus shows to Pilate just with this question. Right? Because I think if Pilate said, I just really want to know who you are, that Jesus would have done that with him and said, I am the Messianic King of the Jews, and I am here for salvation, and you can experience that. Right? And so Jesus, in the same way, can and reach out, will reach out to you no matter what. He is there, listening and waiting for you to respond to him. And so Jesus continues and answers. Right? And so it kind of continues going back and forth in verse 35. Um, Jesus, Pilate says, right, am I a Jew? Do I really know what's going on? I don't know what's happening. Can you explain it to me? Because your religious leaders just handed you over. And so Jesus begins to answer. And when Jesus answers with, right, the first part of his answer is my kingdom, right? You only say my kingdom if you are a king. And so he's essentially answering the earlier question in this when he says my kingdom. And then he explains what that is, basically saying I am a king, but not how you think, right? My kingdom is not of this world. It's not an earthly kingdom, which is what we talked about. If it was of this world, he says this, right? I'd have an army. I'd have fighters. People would be coming, trying to rescue me, trying to break me out of prison. There would be uprising in the city. I wouldn't, basically, I wouldn't be standing here right now if I was this kind of king because I would have already been rescued and back in our hideout, Right? So he's not some revolutionary leader looking to start an uprising. His kingdom is not of this world. It's not a military thing. And so for us who have been in church for a long time, we may think, yes, of course it's not of this world. This is a spiritual kingdom that Jesus is talking about. Right? A kingdom that can only be seen and experienced in the spiritual realm and only lived out in the hearts and the minds of people. But I want to challenge us a little bit because it's not only a spiritual kingdom either, right? It's not just an inward, subjective kingdom of reigning in the hearts of some people. It's more than that, right? In some ways, it's both. Yes, you enter into the kingdom of God through an inward change in allegiance by trusting in Jesus and turning your life over to him. But that's not where it stops. It doesn't just stop with an inward change of, oh, yes, I believe in Jesus. I'm renewed. That's it. Right? We expect this inward change to flow out of us and affect the way that we live our lives, the way that we make decisions, the way that we interact with other people. And we expect those things to interact, to flow out into others and affect the people around us. So this is a kingdom not born out of a rebellion against earthly powers, but born out of submission to God that is spiritual and earthly. Right? Because what we're really talking about is where the source of this kingdom is. Right? The source of this kingdom, the power of this kingdom, doesn't come from earth. It comes from somewhere else. It comes from above. 
It's centered in heaven around the throne, the throne of God with Jesus seated at his right hand. Right? And so this kingdom has a divine origin that moves into the world to reconcile us to each other and to God. So the questioning continues, and Pilate thinks he's got him, right? So you are a king, right? I got you. You said you were a king. Now I know what's going on. And so Jesus responds, and I think in this answer, right, you say that I'm a king for this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world. And as I was reading this, like, there's a, that's a significant statement that he just kind of sneaks into this trial, Right? Not just about who he was, but about what he came to do. Right? For this purpose, I was born. For this purpose, I came into the world. He says, for this purpose, twice. Right? Like, lights going off, lights flashing. This is what I came to do. And so it tells us what he did. Because the big question that people have is, why did Jesus come to earth? Right? That's a question all of us have to understand and all of us have to answer. Why did he leave heaven to be born as a baby and live among us as a human? Why did he do this? And here is the answer, right? To bear witness or to testify to the truth. And I thought about this answer this week and I asked, how would I answer this question? What did Jesus come to earth to do? And how I would answer it. And then I thought, if I passed around pieces of paper and we all in this room answered it and we wrote it down, I'm fairly confident that no one would write to testify to the truth or to bear witness to the truth, right? We would write lots of other things, right? To reveal more of who God was in a way that we could understand and see, to give an example of a godly life and what it, how it's supposed to be lived, to give his life on the cross and open the door to salvation, And all those answers are good and right. But here's Jesus' own statement saying, I came to testify to the truth. That's why he came. And so I think it's worth it to take a couple of minutes and talk through what that means. What is this truth? And how does it affect us? And what does it mean? What is he bearing witness to in these statements? But first of all, it just means, right, there is truth. Now, that seems like a basic statement, but in our culture, it feels a little bit radical just to say there is truth that is bigger than all of us, that applies to everyone, that everyone can build on, can understand, can know, and build their lives around. A truth that comes outside of us, right, is bigger than us, not something we can learn on our own or do enough research and study to come up with, but something bigger and greater and unchanging, an absolute truth. It does exist. But more specifically, what is this truth? I think this is the truth about Jesus himself, and as a result, it's the truth about ourselves is included as well. Because the truth that he is testifying to is the truth that he came into the world, God incarnate, God in human form, fully God and fully man, to call us to repent and believe. Because if you go back and read the Gospels, this is basically what Jesus says every time. He says, repent and believe that the kingdom is here. So that's what he calls us to do, right? To repent of our own failings, of our turning away, of our rebellion against our creator, and to believe that salvation was both necessary and possible. Necessary because we are sinners in need of salvation and possible through the life and death of Jesus. And as we come to this week, this holy week, as we think about Easter and Good Friday and all the things that are included, we find Jesus here, especially here in this passage, at the end of his testimony, right? He's only got a few days left. And he is testifying of what he has done up to this point and what he is about to do. And as we go through Holy Week, this is what Jesus is doing. He is showing us the truth. As we think about Palm Sunday, as we think about Good Friday, as we think about the Last Supper, as we think about his trials, as we think about his death, and then next Sunday, it's not a spoiler, but um, he comes back to life. Um, (laughs) Right? If you didn't know that, uh, ask your neighbor before you go home what that's all about, because we'll tell you. Um, But it's that truth that he's showing us, the truth about himself and the truth about ourselves in that and what we need. 
And so this week, as you go through, yes, there's a lot of things and a lot of services, and all of those are going to be great, but I hope that we would use those as springboards to reflect on what Jesus endures, to reflect on what Jesus experiences in this week, and also why that was necessary. Why was it necessary for Jesus to do the thing that he does in this week? To experience, to endure, to suffer, to die. Why does he do that? Why is it necessary? Because that's the testimony he is giving us. All right, I'm not even going to answer that for you. You get to answer that one on your own. And so the question, and as we come kind of to bring all of this together, is how will you respond to the truth? How will you respond to the truth? The truth that Jesus is the true king. The one who will rule forever, both in this world and the world to come. Right, The true testimony about himself, that he is the one who has come down from heaven and given himself for our good, for our salvation, to break the power and penalty of sin over us, to set us free and to reveal the truth about ourselves, that we're all broken, we're all rebellious, we're all in need of a savior. We're in need of someone to rescue us. That he is the only one giving us the full truth about ourselves and this world. Will you respond like Pilate, whose last words are, what is truth? Right? Missing the truth that is standing right in front of him. Even though that was his whole job in this scenario, was to understand what was true. What's true about Jesus? Why is he here? What is he trying to do? That was Pilate's job in this questioning. And he misses it right in front of him. He can't quite find it. He couldn't see it. So will you ask, what is truth? And then seek to find it on your own or to determine for yourself what is true about yourself and the world. Or will you see and believe? Will you search for? Will you seek out the truth? And how will you do that? How will you seek out the truth? What will you determine? What sources will you do to find truth? Is truth something that's bigger than you? That comes from outside? Or is it something that only comes from within? I'm basically saying it's something bigger than us, right? That comes from outside that helps us to see clearly who we are, who we were created to be, and what we're supposed to do with our lives in light of what Jesus has done. And if you choose to believe that it is true, will you just stop at knowing the truth? Or will you believe it and live it out? Because the point here isn't just to know the truth about Jesus. Oh, yeah, I read the story. I know some facts about Jesus. I'm good. I know where that is. But it goes further than that. And we've talked about this over the course of the series. The phrases are usually paired together, right? Hearing and believing. And those two together mean not just hearing and understanding or knowing, but living it out, that those things would be true of your life and would impact the way that you live, and all living it out together. Um, A couple of guys and I are reading a book. Um, It's called Why Believe. It's an apologetics book. It's pretty good um, if you're looking for something in that realm. It's from a scientific perspective. I'm not giving it 100, but like a solid 85. Um, But in the book, he talks kind of about the issues, and one of them is the hiddenness of God. And so he has this concept that if God showed up today, this morning, in this building and said, here I am, I'm real, everybody look at me and see that I exist, right? And he was here. And so that was taken off the table. Everybody's seen him, everybody knows him, everybody knows that he exists because we've all experienced that together. He says, would that make a difference? if we all knew that God was real? And his answer surprised me a little bit, and I'm still kind of working through it, but I'm through it enough to kind of share it with you and challenge you a little bit. And he said, no, it wouldn't really make that much of a difference. Because the call for us isn't just to believe that God exists and to know that he is real, right? That's step one, that's good, but it's more than that. 
right? Because he says the call of the scripture, the call of Christianity isn't just to know that God exists and to be able to say, yes, that is true. Like on a true false question, does God exist? Yes. Okay, I'm good. That's not the criteria for becoming a Christian, right? The criteria for becoming a Christian is giving your life over to him and believing in what Jesus has done for you, right? It's a submission to that truth and what it means for you because of who you are, a broken sinner. And trusting that Jesus stood in the gap for you and took the punishment for your sins and makes you whole, right? Because being a Christian and a follower of Jesus is not about a list of facts, right? It's about a life change that happens within us and then flows out and affects everything around us. Because following Jesus, it's not about facts. It's about allegiance to the true king. That's what it's about. And then we have these verses at the end. And I wasn't quite sure what to do with these, where it's like, okay, Pilate does the questioning, and then he says, you know what I'll do? I'll give them a chance to change their mind, and I'll offer them Jesus or Barabbas, and they can pick one, and I'll let one of them go. I'm almost 100% sure he was thinking, oh, they'll definitely choose Jesus over this guy who was a murderer, right? But they don't. And I think this, connected to this passage and the way we're looking at it, shows us this is what happens without truth, right? Pilate didn't know who Jesus was, He sort of didn't care who Jesus was as long as he wasn't a threat to his well-being. But Pilate isn't motivated by truth in this passage. What he's motivated by is saving his own skin, right? Whatever I can do that lessens the impact, that keeps people from rioting, that keeps trouble from my district, that's what I'm going to do. So he is motivated by the people, something outside of himself. And so Pilate does this, and I think it's a a, sort of a caution to us hidden in here, right? If you are not grounded in the truth, you are easily swayed by others and those around you and the culture. And so when somebody says, you should believe this, or you should act like this, or you should not believe this, or you shouldn't say this, and all the things that we hear swirling around us in our time, if you're not grounded in the truth, all of those things begin to push you and twist you, and turn you. And then, I think it's, I don't know, I think about my kids and the teenagers in this room, like all of this stuff is swirling around, and everybody's saying, well, what's your truth? What is true for you? And I'm saying, if you don't know this truth, you're just going to get whipped around for the rest of your life. Right? Every time the opinions change or something comes up on social media and that's the new thing, you're just going to keep moving around and moving around and you're never truly going to understand who you are. Right? So if, if you're here in this room, adult, teenager, child, whatever, this is the truth. This is what you can hold on to. This is what you can be grounded in. This will never let you down. This will never change. And it will help you filter all of the things that come at you in your life. And choose and understand and say, no, that's not true because I know this. And I don't need to change this about myself to fit into this crowd or to be accepted by these people because I'm already accepted by the king. And you can let all of the other stuff go. And it sounds like an amazing life to be able to do that. But I also know it's super, super, super hard. Right? Even for us that have known this, like, I'm, I'm going to, man, I'm actually coming up on 40 years of knowing this um, and understanding this and believing this. And it's still hard to say, no, this is true about me when everything is swirling around you. Or you're looking for a job and no one will hire you. Or you're dealing with your kids and they're going crazy and you're having the same parent teacher conference that you have every year and you're like, I don't know the answer to this. Right? Or maybe things are going great, and you're getting all of the success, and people are telling you how amazing you are, and you're like, I am amazing. I'll just keep doing whatever I want. Right? All of those things need to be filtered through the truth that comes in the gospel. Right? Because it gives us a foundation. It gives us a rock to build from. 
And so I think what we're walking away from this is, let's set our foundation on the truth of Jesus, the true king who has come to rescue us and to redeem us. Let's pray. God, we come before you and we thank you for your truth. We thank you that you are the king, that you are ruling and reigning. We thank you that you do come before us and you go before us and you love us. And they give us an example, even in just a few questions and answers of, of what truth is and what you have come to do and your purpose in this life was to love us and to rescue us and to redeem us and that even if, right, we may, you may have come into this room like Pilate, right, opposed to Jesus, that even in that moment, Jesus reaches out to Pilate and he gives him a chance. And just know for all of us here that Jesus gives you a chance. He loves you. He is open for redemption. He is open for salvation. He is open to help you wherever you are. And for all of us, help us just to, yes, believe, but also to trust in you and to live out these truths that we see in Scripture that remind us of who we truly are and what we truly need and how that impacts the world around us. So God, help us to serve you as the true king. It's in your name we pray. Amen.